All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Preparing for Reconnect Round 4 webinar. We are This webinar is meant to help potential applicants prepare for the next funding opportunity announcement. We will cover some items applicants can begin preparing now before the application window opens. However, this is not meant to be a comprehensive list of requirements or documentation needed to submit a Reconnect application. This webinar is only the beginning of outreach events we plan to host for Reconnect Round 4. Once the funding opportunity announcement is available, we will begin hosting deep dive webinars on the application requirements, the funding opportunity announcement, and we will host a multi-day workshop and Q&A sessions. Now I would like to introduce Chris McLean, Acting Administrator for the Rural Utility Service. We are very happy to have him with us here today. Mr. Administrator, would you like to kick us off? Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Welcome to everybody out in the listening audience and viewing audience there. Um, welcome to High Speed Summer um, at RUS. We've, we've designated this as our High Speed Summer because we have a tremendous number of high speed broadband internet events coming up. And uh, we are very excited. And like all good thoughts of summer, we think of hot dogs, baseball, and blockbuster sequels. And so we've got a real big blockbuster coming your way with FOA number four. So let me give you a little preview of some of the things that we're going to be doing over this summer. Uh, right now, uh, the team telecom is busily uh, evaluating 305 applications from round three um, FOA. The, Reconnect Round 3 award uh, systems, and uh, they're, uh, they're starting to uh, come to the conclusion on a number of those uh, projects. And so be prepared. We'll be doing some announcements on awards from Round 3. And Rounds 1 and Rounds 2, almost every single one of those projects have cleared their environmental. We've got a couple that are still uh, Few, iron, th few things to iron out from um, previous rounds, but they are now going to construction and uh, we will be having probably ground breakings and ribbon cuttings and some are already cutting over new consumers. It's very, very exciting. And then the coming attractions that we're here for today will be FOA number four. That will be coming a little bit later in the summer as well as um, a lot of interest and activity about what's going on with our fellow federal uh, agencies engaged in broadband investment this year at NTIA and the Department of Treasury. So as was explained, um, we have not yet released our funding notice, so uh, we're not going to be able to give you every single detail, but think of today um, as your coming attractions trailer for our next blockbuster, which is the Reconnect FOA number four. And, you know, we can give you a little sneak peek of what's to come. Um, and there's some things that you can do to be ready uh, for FOA number four. Um, and we hope that you um, start, start preparing. And so um, let me give you a few tips um, as you um, watch today and participate in today's um, webinar. So the one thing you could do, just like with all great uh, blockbuster sequel movies, you can kind of catch up on the previous editions. Take a look at what we did in rounds one, rounds two, and rounds three, um, because there'll be some similarities. But just like every sequel, there's a little plot twist in each one of our storylines. So take a look at our source material, which would be our statutes. And you'll notice between each one of our rounds of funding, We've had a different funding statute that tweaked um, the storyline a little bit. And so there'll, there'll be a couple of plot twists, but there'll be some differences um, driven by the uh, statutory requirements um, that are backing our fourth round of funding, which is tied to the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill. And perhaps most importantly, make sure to get your ticket of admission as early as possible. And what am I talking about ticket admission? I'm talking about your SAMS registration. So you're going to hear a lot about that today. I will tell you that um, since the federal government uh, started to shift from other registration systems to SAMS, um, there's a long line. So please be prepared. Um, give yourself plenty of time. If you don't have a SAMS registration, please make sure that you uh, get up and, and get started on that as quickly as possible. So 
when uh, we release the FOA and open the gate, uh, open the admission gates uh, for entry of, of uh, projects into our application portal, you will be ready to go and you will have your ticket of admission. So we want to really thank you for your interest in um, providing uh, broadband services and high-speed internet services to rural America. We are so excited to be your partner in this endeavor. And uh, we have a really good lineup to, for you today. And so enjoy the show. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck to everybody. Great. Thanks, Chris. Next, I would like to introduce our two speakers for today. Ariana Kelly is a Management and Program Analyst in the Rural Utility Service Policy and Outreach Division. She will be conducting the mapping demo for today's presentation. But first, we will hear from Ken Wiseman, who is also a Management and Program Analyst, and will begin today's presentation. Ken? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken Wiseman, and as was mentioned, I'm one of the policy or one of the Management and Program Analysts for the policy work zone as the ReConnect program. We're really happy to have you all here today. We're gonna to cover a number of things, but just as you've heard our assistant administrator, uh, our acting administrator say a moment ago, there are plenty of things that we can tell you now to help you get ready, but there are some things that we just cannot go into. So we will not be covering the details related to the upcoming funding opportunity announcement. We cannot tell you when it's gonna be published, but there are plenty of things here today that whether you be a first time applicant or a returning applicant, you will be able to take something away from today's webinar that will help you when you get ready to do that application for the fourth round, the next round of funding that we have. As part of this, I wanna make sure that everyone's focused on our slide deck. So I'm actually gonna turn off my camera and we're going to do that. We'll be covering, if I can get the next slide, please. We have our agenda here. We'll be covering a number of things that we have as part of being able to put in an application. We're going to cover system registration requirements, applicant identification requirements, a high level overview of the authorized representative request or ARR. We'll do an introduction of the ReConnect program and the documents that you can get ahead of time. We'll have some application tips. My colleague will give us a demonstration of the ReConnect map and some next steps. And then at the end of this, we are going to do a Q&A session. So we do welcome the, the questions that you have and we will put as much time to answering those as humanly possible. As, as has been mentioned, and I'll say again, this is meant to be an introduction. So in no way is it meant to be a comprehensive presentation of the program requirements and components. We have a very large and robust schedule for this summer full of events that will be available on our events page of the ReConnect website that you'll be able to come to and we'll actually be able to give you a lot of very detailed information in those events. Next slide, please. All right, we're going to really get into how to start this up. And so to begin, we're gonna to need to talk about some of the important items that you will need in order to literally to just start an application. Many of these items can be completed now before that window opens. Use the time that you do have to set up your organization for a smooth application process. You can really do that by getting ahead with these recommendations. Please note that throughout the presentation, we might reference some materials that were in the round three application guide. If we mention those, they will not change for round four. So that is a little bit of get ahead homework for you. However, the application guide will be updated in a comprehensive sense for round four. So when we do open the application window and you have a question about the round four application, I would strongly recommend that you go to that new application guide and it will be on the website. With that said, again, we won't be going into the funding opportunity announcement for round four. Next slide, please. SAM.gov registration. All applicants, all of you, every single applicant that we will get must have what is considered both current and active registration in SAM.gov prior to submitting the application. It can take three weeks. 
from the time you submit your sam.gov registration for it to become active so you're in a great window to go on and get yourself a sam.gov registration it must remain active and current while being considered for an award and if you were to receive the award while that award is active the financial certifications and representations must be made before applying and we're going to go into depth on that in a couple slides from now next slide please the following steps are what are needed for making the financial certifications and representations required of an entity wishing to apply or to receive funds under federal financial assistance projects and programs and as you heard the acting administrator say this is a pretty standard program now Applicants will be asked if the entity wishes to apply for federal financial assistance project or program, or if that entity is currently the recipient of funding under any federal financial assistance project or program. The system will default to no. You as the person going into SAM.gov registration need to change that over to yes. And we're gonna show you that right now. Next slide. This is what it talks about. And as you can see that yellow arrow, it's pointing to the no, that's the default. You need to change that to yes. Next slide, please. To begin, uh, another item that we're gonna need to talk about is the USDA verified level two EAUTH ID. You need to get your EAUTH ID now uh, we receive a ton of emails that come into the contact us help desk where applicants are getting an error when they try to log into the application system and they think they have a level two EAUTH, but the truth is they may have a level one EAUTH. We need you to make sure that you do have level two. You will upgrade your level one unverified version to a level two verified eauth account by managing your account on the eauth website you navigate over to manage account click the update account and from there you can scroll to the personal information page and click to verify your identity there's only a few steps there to have to go through you follow those steps and you will be upgraded to a level two once you get the level two, you'll know it's there because of a green check mark next to your personal information section. And that indicates again that you're verified. We have a great uh, video that will walk you through this and it is on the ReConnect website under the workshop and webinar materials. You can go there and watch that. It'll take you right through the process. Please keep track of your eAuth ID. The Rural Utility Service staff cannot retrieve this for you. You can visit the EAUTH website, reset your password, get your information, but that's not something that here at the staff level we're able to do for you. So please make sure you do keep your login information. Applicants also need to have what we know commonly as the ARR or the authorized representative request in order to complete your application. You cannot submit that right now. Again, it cannot come in. However, there are different things you have to put into an ARR when you, before you can submit it, and those things you can start working on right now. The big one is your resolution. You need to go ahead and be working on that. You also need to get your tax identification number, or 10, and your unique entity identifier, UEI, all applicants must be uh, prepared to submit their application online. It's going to go through our application system. And when the window opens, you will be able to know that it's open because there'll be an additional link available. We're putting some links for you right now in the chat. I would recommend that you take note of those because those are great resources for where to get examples of things and these videos. So please pay attention to those as they come across as well. Next slide. In the last slide, I mentioned how you need the tax ID number or 10 and the UEI in order to complete your ARR. Now, when you get your 10, it can possibly take two weeks 
if you don't have one already. So again, recommend doing that one right now. Ensure that you have an active and a current SAM.gov registration. You will be assigned your UEI when you get your SAM.gov registration. We are unable to retrieve SAM or UEI information for you. Additionally, uh, we want you to know that these systems are not managed by USDA. So if there is a system outage or a maintenance period, that's just beyond our control. And because those do happen, we really do recommend that you get on the ball and, and get these lined up and ready to go now. The cage code that some of you may remember from the past is going to be optional going forward for applicants. Entities are no longer required to enter the cage code as part of the application. You can if you want, not required. The UEI is replacing what we commonly referred to as DUNS, the DUNS and Bradstreet number that many of us remember. DUNS will now be optional, but again, UEI is replacing it. UEI is required and you'll get your UAI when you complete your SAM.gov registration. Next slide, please. All right, we have a transition slide here. We're gonna get into the ARR, or the authorized representative request with a bit more detail. Next slide. Let's talk about this from two different groups of folks. One is a returning applicant and the other is a new applicant. If you are a returning applicant who previously had an approved ARR, you will not have to submit a new one unless a couple of conditions exist. If the roles that you assigned on the previous ARR have changed, you'll need a new one. And if your previous ARR resolution did not request access to all of these communities, ReConnect, Community Connect, and the reporting and compliance systems, if, if it did not bring you into those, you will need a new ARR. All first-time applicants, that's the second group here, all first-time applicants must submit an ARR. And ARRs require an approved resolution Resolutions may take time to get. That's another reason we bring it up now. So be prepared uh, by working on that resolution now. Next slide. Now, here's some, a few more notes on the ARR. They cannot be submitted while the application window is open, but we really do recommend you work on that resolution. If, if your approving authority for the resolution only meets once a quarter, you're going to have to be prepared for when they meet versus how this window uh, of application period happens. And so we strongly recommend you work on that now. We also want you to know that the staff here at USDA uh, in the RUS team, we review these personally. These are not reviewed by a computer. There are actual employees reading these. It takes one to two business days to process. Now note I said one to two business days. That means we don't work on federal holidays and we don't work on weekends. So one to two business days are those days during the week where we would normally be in the office. Uh, so please uh, prepare and, and kind of plan your timeline with that in mind as well. We've got a great link that's in the chat that'll offer you some examples of the resolution and how you can use that to provide for your ARR. Next slide. The ARR process is uh, many things. It, it accomplishes many things. One of those is to designate your rep sign cert and your administrator roles. The rep sign cert has the roles that you see described here on the slide. And the ARR at a minimum must list one rep sign cert However, you can also assign the administrator role to one or more employees. The rep sign cert and the administrator, whether it be one or more administrators, they must be employees of the applicant. There is only one rep sign cert, but you can decide how many administrators you have as long as they're all employees. Individuals who are put on the resolution having a role are only going to have one role assigned to them. And the rep sign cert and the administrators will both have the ability 
to add users to the application ahead or, or after the account is created and the ARR is approved. Next slide, please. When preparing your ARR resolution, please verify that each person is assigned the correct role. The roles on the resolution and the ARR must match exactly. So we're going to compare those two to see same name to the same role in both situations. If it's not, if it's if they're different, we're going to have to reject the ARR. Another issue that we see with ARRs are the legal names of an entity. Make sure that the legal name of the entity is reflected exactly the same in both the resolution and the ARR form. Review the additional instructions and the resolutions that we have as samples if you want more guidance and support. Again, we've got the links here and it's on the ReConnect website. And once the application window, op window opens, not before, but once that window opens, you'll be able to attach the resolution to your ARR and submit it for consideration. Next slide. Again, I'll stress that these take one to two business days to process. We don't work weekends and federal holidays, but these are real people who process these. That being said, if the ARR is approved, the submitter and the contacts listed on the ARR will be notified. If the ARR is rejected, then only the submitter gets an email but we do include a reason as to why that ARR is rejected. So you resolve your issue, resubmit the ARR, you will have to resubmit, and we can consider the resubmission. If for some reason you need help, by all means reach out to us because again, with real people reviewing these, we have real people ready to help you deal with whatever issues you may face. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna get into a, a bit of a program introduction. Uh, please note that the guiding document, the, the, the senior document, if you will, that establishes things for the program is our regulation. That is 7 CFR 1740, 7 CFR 1740. The regulation link just went into chat and the funding opportunity announcement, once it's published, should also be referenced in, in addition to that, that regulation. We're going to talk a little bit later about how those all work together, but we will be, we will be avoiding details on the FOA. However, there are, is a future event that will happen after the FOA is published where we will go into depth on that FOA. Next slide. So at the highest level, what's the intent, right? What, what are we really trying to do here? Well, the ReConnect program provides federal loans, grants, and loan grant combinations to facilitate broadband deployments into rural areas. Funds can be used for the cost of construction, for improvement, or acquisition of facilities and equipment to provide broadband service to eligible areas. Next slide. Definitions really matter, right? Uh, when I went to school to become a paralegal, we were taught that definitions have meaning and meanings have legal impact. So we very, we pay a lot of attention. We're very focused on making sure you have good definitions. And one of the things that we do is we talk about the difference between eligible and ineligible. So as you go through definitions, as we're gonna do here, we're going to be very detailed and also be mindful of, of each side of an issue. So eligible versus ineligible uh, will be discussed. Fixed wireless is defined as a wireless system between two fixed locations. For example, a fixed transmitting tower to a fixed customer premise equipment. Please note that if the network is based on a cellular network, RUS does not consider it to be a fixed wireless system. Broadband service is defined as any fixed terrestrial technology, including fixed wireless, having the capacity to transmit data, voice and video, which is set forth in the funding opportunity announcement, 
once the funding opportunity announcement is available, we encourage you to go and read that to see what the broadband speed requirements will be. A non-funded service area, sometimes known as an NFSA, is defined as any area in which the applicant offers or intends to offer telecommunication services, but is not requesting funding for those services. Proposed funded service area, conversely, uh, it's known as a PFSA, is defined as the area where the applicant is requesting the funding to provide broadband service. An area with sufficient access to broadband is a rural area in which households have broadband service at the minimum acceptable level of broadband, which is also going to be set forth in the funding opportunity announcement. I encourage you to go into our regulation to read even more definitions. And when it's available, the funding opportunity announcement will have some as well. Next slide, please. All right, eligibility requirements. Uh, what is an eligible entity? And again, when we talk about one side of it, we talk about the other. So what is an ineligible entity? The list of eligible entities will not change for round four of the ReConnect program. So that's something you can be ready for. And as you can see here, the eligible entities are corporations, LLCs and LLPs, cooperative or mutual organizations, states and local governments, territories or possessions of the United States, and tribal nations. Please note that individuals, legal partnerships formed with individuals, and co-applicants are not eligible to apply. Next slide, please. Eligible projects. In order for a project to be eligible, applicants must submit audited financial statements. We're going to go into more about this, we're gonna give you some more depth in a, in a few upcoming slides. Eligible projects must also demonstrate a timely build out completion within five years from the date the funds are first made available. It has to have technical and financial feasibility. All project costs can be fully funded or accounted for. Facilities funded with grant funds must provide broadband service for the composite economic life of the facilities. Facilities funded with loan funds must provide broadband service through the amortization period, the payoff period of the loan. This is not a comprehensive list of project eligibility. And I do encourage you to refer to the regulation, the funding opportunity announcement, as well as the many future outreach events that we will be having for more information on what an eligible project is. Next slide. Now let's talk about what is both an eligible and an ineligible service area. This slide outlines the key factors for both. Please note that the service areas of existing RUS borrowers without sufficient access to broadband which will be defined in the upcoming funding opportunity announcement, uh, would be eligible for reconnect funding. For example, a previously constructed community connect project not offering sufficient access to broadband or a broadband initiatives program, BIP project, not offering sufficient access to broadband. In contrast, if these existing borrowers are providing sufficient access to broadband, as defined in that FOA, the, eligible, the areas would be ineligible for reconnect funding. This would be like an RUS broadband loan, including reconnect awards, or a community connect grant that is still being built out. Applicants should discuss the RUS award areas with their general field representatives, GFR, to determine if that area is truly eligible. Our GFRs are the representatives we have locally. We have them in every state. They are a wealth of knowledge, and I can never, ever stress enough that talking to them is a great idea. Next slide, please. 
All right, service areas. Some additional considerations for a service area. Service areas that receive federal broadband funds from the FCC or Federal Communications Commission may be restricted from funding. You will need to read the funding opportunity announcement for more details on additional restrictions. Next slide, please. Some eligible cost purposes. You can see some of those here in an outline of the appropriate ways to use funds from the award. It's important to note that eligible costs must be incurred after the award, post award, with the exception of some approved pre-application expenses. Again, this has not changed from the last round of funding. Up to 3% of a total of up to 5% allowed for pre-application expenses may be used for satisfying environmental review requirements. We encourage you to review the regulation for more details on what is an eligible cost. Next slide. Just as we have eligible, we have ineligible. What are some ineligible cost purposes? Well, award funds may not be used for items that you see here, such as the acquisition of an affiliate, the purchase or to acquire an affiliate's facilities or equipment, and you cannot use this money for operating expenses. An important note here is that the costs that are related to obtaining the irrevocable letter of credit, ILOC, and the indirect costs that your entity may have are considered operating expenses. They are ineligible to be using uh, award funds to cover. Next slide, please. Some more ineligible cost purposes are listed here. The list is also found in the ReConnect regulation. And we encourage you to read in depth in that regulation and the upcoming FOA for eligible and ineligible costs. Next slide. Tribal coordination. This is a, a big piece of the ReConnect program. We want to talk about it here. It is vital that you coordinate with Native American reservations and, and nations or to very, as early as possible in the application process in order to ensure ample time to obtain the appropriate tribal certification. I want to be very clear about this next piece. Any applicant, I mean any applicant, who proposes service on tribal land or proposes to cross tribal land as part of their project must provide a certification from the proper tribal official stating that the tribe supports the project and that they will allow construction on tribal land. The tribal certification must include items here. This information comes directly from the ReConnect program regulation. And I wanna be very clear again, what happens, what's the other side of this, right? Any applicant proposing service on tribal land or proposing to cross tribal land who submits an application without the certification will not be considered for funding. You must get this. We encourage you to, to coordinate as soon as possible because this will also be something, this tribal resolution will also be something that's likely to take time to get, so start early. Next slide. All right, some required documents. We are going to cover a number of very important documents that are all required. However, we're not going to be able to cover every document. The ones that we do cover today are those you can work on right now. If you are a returning applicant, you should review the account section of the application to ensure that the documents there are accurate. Returning ReConnect applicants do not have to delete account documents from previous rounds. If you need to update the document, you just replace what's there with the updated version. Next slide.
So the next couple of slides will cover the required account documents uh, that, that go into the document upload section. Note that the table that you have here also explains which entity is required to submit each type of document, and there are some differences. While all document, while all account documents uh, that go into that section will require multiple uh, uploads, there's, there's, there are a lot of documents, you'll have to upload all of them individually. This list here is not an exhaustive list for everything that's required for the application. Other sections of the application, such as the network section, the financial section, and the environmental section, will also have document uploads. These are documents you can already be working on. Uh, you may already have them. If you don't, go ahead and start working on them now. Um, you probably, if you're an LLC or an LLP, you probably already have your articles of organization. Um, if you're uh, an entity that's going to need articles of incorporation, you probably already have those. But you may need to sit down and design your affiliates organizational chart if that applies to you. So just be aware of what you are, are going to need to have and, and go work on those you don't already have. Next slide. Here are some more documents. I want to point out in particular that broadband operations experience, that first one there, that is something that every single applicant, regardless of type, will be required to submit. Um, if you have 100 or more employees, you'll need to give us your EEO1 report, for example. There's another one there. Next slide, please. All right, here is, uh, uh, again, more documents. Um, this slide deck, I know some of you are taking notes. The slide deck is available uh, on the ReConnect website. If you don't get everything today, that's fine. Um, but here's some more of them. Uh, I do want to especially point out the organizational chart. That is one that is universal. Every single applicant must submit this. Uh, there are some that, the, some of these documents, I guess the, the easy way to say it is if you have, uh, if you're a parent company and a subordinate company relationship, uh, you, I want to point out here that parent company documents are required if the applicant does have a parent company. So start working with your parent company now if you need to get these documents from them. Next slide. Resumes of key management are required for all applicants. If the applicant has a subsidiary, you're going to need to submit subsidiary documents as well. Uh, these required documents are all going to stay the same in round four as they were previously, but a few may move to other sections of the application. So getting all of them together now is good. When you get in the application, put them in the appropriate location. Next slide. Licenses and agreements. This is another one that you can work on ahead of time. Once the application is open, this section may be completed at any time. It is a section that is not dependent on other application sections. The application guide contains a full list of agreements. The application guide that's there from round three describes it in the same exact way that you'll see in round four. So you can go ahead and read those because it will not change in round four. Not all licenses will apply to every entity. However, you must assign a status to every document. So if it doesn't apply to you, you will say that it does not apply to you. Next slide, please. Here you can see the list of licenses and agreements that are included in the application. Again, some of these may not apply to you. You will need to assign a status to every single one of them when you go through. So if, again, if it doesn't apply to you, you'll say that it does not apply. Next slide. Uh, one of the required documents to, to definitely discuss is the legal opinion. All applicants, all of you, must upload a legal opinion. 
even if the applicant is returning from the last round, a new legal opinion must be uploaded. So I'll say that again. Even if you're returning, a new legal opinion must be uploaded. The legal opinion must address the applicant's ability to enter into award documents. It must describe all material pending litigation matters. It must address the applicant's ability to pledge security as required by the award documents, and it must address the applicant's ability to provide broadband service under state or tribal law. A sample of the legal opinion is on the ReConnect website. The link has been put into chat, I know, several times. Please go and review that there. Next slide. So financial requirements. Applicants will also be required to submit financial information. This includes several items like audited financial statements, detailed information for outstanding and contingent obligations, evidence of all other funding necessary to, su to support the project, financial pro formas, including four years of historical data, a current bridge year, and five years of projections. There are two exceptions to that, and I wanna discuss those here. Publicly traded companies who have investment grade bond ratings do not need to submit the non-funded service areas, NFSAs, or complete the pro forma financial projections. However, you will have to submit evidence of your bond rating if you are one of these types of entities. The other issue is for 100% grant applications, that are going to include the irrevocable letter of credit, ILOC. It does, you will not need to submit NFSAs or complete the pro forma financial projections. However, you will need to, to include uh, some type of evidence showing that you are going to use the ILOC. There is a block you will have to check on the application as well. And that if you are selected for award closing, you will have to have the financial documents for the ILOC being in place at award closing. Next slide, please. Okay, some additional items here. If a subsidiary is applying for ReConnect, the applicant must submit financials on a standalone basis. Consolidated financial information for the pro forma is not acceptable. The financial pro forma should include subscriber estimates related to all proposed service offerings, annual financial projections with balance sheets, income statements, and cash flow statements, supporting assumptions for the five year forecast period, and a depreciation schedule for existing facilities, those facilities funded with federal assistance, matching funds, and other types of funds. Next slide, please. Required documents, audited financials, very important piece here. Now in a previous slide, I mentioned that all applicants will need to submit audited financial statements. The type of audit that you submit that is required of you depends on the type of entity you are. Corporations, commercial businesses, LLCs, cooperatives, and mutual organizations are required to submit unqualified comparative audited financial statements. Additionally, an applicant can use the consolidated audit of a parent if the parent fully guarantees the loan, or in the case of a grant application, that parent is gonna guarantee the construction will be completed as approved in the application or repay that grant to the RUS uh, staff. Historical and pro forma financial information must be the applicant's own information provided on a standalone basis. If the applicant has multiple parents, then every parent's audit must be submitted and every parent must fully guarantee the award, loan or grant. Applicants using the parent's audits will be required to provide their own audit if awarded. Next slide. All right, this one, uh, we, we, we really want to get this one right. So to avoid any confusion about what qualifies, 
as unqualified comparative audited financials. I want to explain each of the terms here. An unqualified opinion means the opinion of the auditor provides all, that they provide on the financial statement. An unqualified opinion is an independent auditor's judgment that a company's financial statements are fairly and appropriately presented without any identified exceptions and in compliance with the accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. The acronym for that is USGAAP. Comparative refers to presenting multiple years of information so that the financial statements can be compared to previous years. Comparative financial statements show two or more consecutive years of information, all years having been subjected to an audit, and the auditor is providing an opinion on all those years presented. Typically, only two years are presented, which is the minimum number of years that are required. Then the term audited. It refers to the fact that the financial statements have been audited by an independent certified public accountant, CPA. The audits of our awardees must be conducted in accordance with the generally accepted government auditing standards, GAGAS. Next slide. Now, in, in contrast to that, those entities require, those entities that we just discussed have to have comparative audits. There are a number of non-federal entities subject to 2 CFR 200, and they instead have to submit a single audit. Those entities are authorities, municipalities, public bodies, public power and utility districts, uh, Indian tribes and tribal governments, higher education institutions, nonprofits, territories, or possessions of the United States, and state and local government. Next slide, please. As, the, as we keep talking about these audited financials, all audited financials must be from the year prior to the application submission. If an application is submitted and the most recent year in audit has not been completed, the applicant can submit the previous unqualified audit that has been completed. If qualified audits containing a disclaimer or adverse opinion are submitted, the application simply will not be considered. Again, I want to remind everyone here that entities that are required to submit unqualified comparative audited financial statements, this means that the audited financials would include two or more consecutive years of information. If you are an entity that does a single audit, I would encourage you to go read 2 CFR 200 and specifically 2 CFR 200.501 for more information. Uh, those are the entities that would file with the Federal Audit Clearinghouse as specified under 2 CFR 200.512. Now for government entities, financial statements must be accompanied by certifications as to unrestricted cash that may be available on a yearly basis to the applicant. And before we can move to the next, slide in this presentation, I want to have everyone remember that we did not cover every single one of these documents today. Uh, the documents we did cover are ones that you can work on now. They are documents that we get a significant number of questions about. Additional application sections will be, uh, will require additional document uploads. Again, I, I cited some of those as like financial, environmental, and network sections. When you get to those, you'll see the documents necessary for that. If we can go to the next slide, please. We're gonna cover some important tips for the application system. Next slide. Our system, if you, have, if you have applied before, you know exactly what, I'm, what I mean when I say what I'm about to say. For, for everyone's sake here, our system is networked together, meaning what you put into one section is gonna impact what you put in other sections. And if you make changes, it's gonna change other places. 
So our recommendation is that you do what we call the left to right, top to bottom approach. You complete the application from left to right in the, the, the bar that you'll see in the application uh, system. And the top to bottom is when you start at the top of a page, work your way from the top to the bottom. Be very cautious about changing project information data, uh, service areas, and the network once you start your financial section. Some other examples I'll leave you with here, the funding type of an application absolutely cannot be changed once selected. When you pick that, it will align itself to the specific questions you have to answer for that specific funding type. So if you change your funding type, it changes everything that you need to answer. You would have to start a new application in the system. And when you start a new one, data does not transfer from the old to the new. Uh, when you get into the application, if you pick that you're going to use the ILOC, uh, the irrevocable letter of credit, or if you designate that you are a publicly traded company, those answers are locked once you save them. Again, if you, if you select that and you're going through the application, it's going to give you questions specific to that type of, of application. And if you decide you're going to change how you handle the ILOC or the publicly traded company question, it will require you to start a new application and have to enter all data again. If you answer yes to the NFSA or UPLF's questions in the project information, uh, it will display the relevant sections of the capital investment workbook uh, in the network section, and it will also give you relevant portions of the financial section. So as we talk about upstream and downstream, it, what you do in one place impacts what happens in the future. Next slide, please. Applicants need to complete the application section and 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 and. What we recommend again, that little, that little jingle is the left to right, top to bottom. This is what you're gonna see when you log in. This is what I mean left to right. So you start on that green tab and when, when you get to each of those, those, those sections, then you see the blue hyperlink portions going down. That's your top to bottom. Each one of those would open a new page. Take each of those pages, top to bottom, left to right, top to bottom. It really does matter. Um, I was here in the, in the previous round of funding as a staffer, and that was an, an issue that many people tripped up on. And so they had to go back several sections. So left to right, top to bottom is the best advice we can give you. Next slide, please. Again, uh, many application systems are dependent on, on previous sections and, and subsections. Complete the application section in the order they're displayed. And for example, project information will feed into network and financial sections. And so if information on the project information page changes, the data in the network and financial sections will actually be deleted and you'll have to go back into those sections and deal with them again. Service area information will feed in the network financials, environmental and evaluation criteria sections, changing the first part will impact the follow-on parts. And the network section feeds into the financial section. Next slide, please. It should be clear now, at least I hope so, that there are tons of things that you can begin working on now. So for those of you who are hoping we will give you bits of information in round four FOA, Here's the information we're going to give you. These are the things you could work on. There's a lot about that next BOA we just can't talk about. But we really are giving you tips of what you can do to get ready. And it doesn't matter if you're a returning applicant. Some of this stuff you may need to refresh. And if you're a new applicant, you're definitely going to need to pull it all together. Once that window opens, please begin working on your application immediately. Please do not wait till the last week. Mapping, network design, financial, and environmental sections are pretty intense. I'll tell you, as a staffer, uh, we help test those systems, um, and there is a lot of time and attention 
required to go through those. So start as soon as you can. First time applicants must complete the basic account information before you can even begin your application. You simply will not see the button that says start application until it's completed. Account documents can be uploaded while working on the application, but must be completed before you submit the application. And I'll also remind those returning applicants to review their account section on their application to ensure that it's accurate. Returning reconnect applicants do not have to delete account documents, but you may need to update something. If you need to update it, you just replace what's there with the updated version. Next slide, please. All right, we have a really cool demonstration for you today and my colleague, Ariana Kelly, uh, is going to take over. And I learn something every time that I see this mapping demonstration done. And so I hope that all of you will enjoy it and learn as much as I do. Uh, now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ariana, the show is yours. Thank you so much, Ken. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for everyone. So as Ken mentioned, uh, my name is Ariana Kelly. I am also a um, analyst with the Policy and Outreach Division for the Telecom Program. And today I'm gonna showcase uh, the great new functionality we've added to our publicly available service area map. Um, so let's just jump right in. Um, for starters, this map can be accessed from the Reconnect Loan and Grant uh, homepage by scrolling about halfway through the page. And you'll see a button here that says New Mapping Tool. That will bring you to the service area map. And when we first access the map, we see here that we're alerted to a splash screen. So this page informs us that the web map was created in support of the ReConnect program to help assist potential applicants in determining service area eligibility across the United States. Um, from here, we can access pages that provide additional information on the map data sets and evaluation criteria that make up each layer. So please note that the data sets provided in this page will be updated to align with the latest FOA when that information is available. So if I select the first link here, it will bring us to the service area map data sets page. Um, this page drives the layers, the uh, map data set layers that we'll, that we'll see today. Um, here we have the evaluation criteria data sets. Um, we have a quick definition of what those data sets mean. Um, as well as the ability to download these data sets to our local computer and drop them into our own GIS software for further analysis if needed. Moving back to the map, uh, we also have a link to the evaluation criteria. This is gonna drive the evaluation layers of the map. And this page will provide helpful information regarding scoring criteria and how those points are awarded. So let's just start with some basic navigation of the map. Um, at the top of the page here, you can see a banner that alerts us that we are in the ReConnect Program Service Area Map. Uh, if we scroll or if we move over to the right side of the screen, uh, we see a few icons. So the first of these icons is the legend. This will help us identify which layers we currently have visible on the map. The second icon is going to be your layer list. Here we can toggle different eligibility and evaluation layers on and off. If we select the three dots next to a layer, we can find some additional functionality for that layer, such as adjusting the transparency. The additional functionality that we're showcasing in today's demo was built to better help you understand how your PFSA may be eligible for additional points or additional exceptions to funding considerations during the application process by how your PFSAs overlap the layers that are mentioned here. 
So for today's exercise, um, I'm just going to turn on a few layers and I'm gonna have the FAR level four layer on. I'm gonna have the economic need of community layer on or the SAFE layer. And I'm gonna have the socially vulnerable communities layer on. Moving on to the third icon here, this is your base map gallery. You can use this uh, icon to change your reference map. So it'll help you better visualize uh, geographic information in your area of interest. And lastly, you have the help icon. And this has some great tips on how to use the map. Uh, this help window is a great tool to reference if you need any additional assistance after today's demonstration. Moving back to the left side of the screen, we have the zoom in and zoom out buttons. Below that, we have a home icon. This will return our view to the default extent of the map, which is what we see when we first open the web map. And then below that, we have the my location button. And this will zoom in on your physical location if you have location tracking turned on in your browser. Up here, we have the search bar. You can search several different ways. Uh, you can search by city, state, address, and even lat longs. Uh, if you need to narrow your search uh, just within uh, specific layers um, that may or may not be eligible, you, you do have the ability to um, search within the protected broadband borrower service area layer and the pending applications layer. And lastly, we have these two great new features um, that I briefly mentioned. Uh, this is a great resource for applicants to better analyze uh, their service areas and how they interact with the layers um, before starting the application process. So using this um, upload and the draw tool here, you now have the ability to upload your own service area shapefile or manually draw your service areas on the, on the map and perform your own analysis, excuse me. So let's start with um, showcasing the upload um, shapefile tool. So it's important to know that this will only analyze a polygon or multiple polygons with one set of features. Um, so a shape file that includes more than one feature is not supported and any attempt to upload multiple feature polygons will result in an error message. Um, this is also uh, mentioned over in the help window. So again, if you run into any issues while attempting to perform your own analysis, please remember to utilize that help button. But I want to show you uh, what happens if you do try to upload a shapefile that's not compatible. So when I select the upload shapefile, um, I get this upload shapefile menu and I'm going to select add shapefile. And I'm going to select a zipped shapefile that I know uh, will not work in the system. So I can see that the shapefile will load. I can see where it is on my map. However, when I select run to perform my analysis, you can see that no analysis was performed and I've received an error message. But let's upload a, a similar shapefile. So I'm gonna clear this out. And this is gonna have um, non-contiguous polygons, just like the first one, but it's just gonna have one feature. So again, you can see it's two separate polygons, um, but if you had a GIS, if you had GIS software and you opened up the attribute table, this would just be one line um, of attributes. So if I select run here and give it just a second, I can see that the tool did successfully perform uh, my analysis um, and it can upload uh, multi-part polygons with no problem. So I'm going to clear that out and I'm just going to add um, a simple single polygon for the rest of this analysis and I'll select run. <clears throat> so I can see that um, I have a few criteria that have been analyzed um, when I select the run tool. So I can see that the SVI layer has 100% overlap. And I can just check my legend to say, um, to make sure there aren't any other areas that are popping up that I don't know about. And I can see, okay, it is just the socially vulnerable communities. I can see that with the um, light blue 
um, area that surrounds my polygon. Um, but I'm not done with uh, with my analysis. I, I see that the SAPE, um, the FAR, and tribal lands are, are there's no overlap. Um, but that's not all of the the tools that I have in my layers here. So I want to turn on a few of my eligibility layers and take a look and see if if I have overlapped any of those. So I'm going to turn on um, my pending applications and protected borrower. So if I go ahead and turn off, I, I'm pretty comfortable with what my uh, socially vulnerable area looks like. So I'm going to turn that off so it's not uh, distracting me from my, my new layers. And I can see that I do have a, a bit of an overlap with the protected borrower. And I can even select that area and I can see uh, the company that provides service in that area. So um, with that, I know that maybe I want to alter my PFSA. I don't want it to overlap this area. So what I can do here is I can clear this out. I'm pretty familiar with what my um, shape, my polygon looks like, and I'm going to use this draw service area tool. Um, so we have a few different options here, uh, several different shapes. Um, the one I use most often is just this freehand polygon. So I'm just going to select the shape that I want to use, and then I'm just going to start clicking to create vertices on the map. So I'm going to create those vertices, just clicking at each point, avoiding that area that I no longer want to overlap. And then I'm going to double click to complete my um, area, and I'm going to select Run again. So we'll get another look at those um, few evaluation layers. And I can see, okay, great. So I'm still with 100% with the so within the socially vulnerable communities layer. And you can see here when you draw a service area that we have this um, great functionality where I can actually download the shape file that I've created um, to my local computer. So all I have to do is select this button and it's gonna give me the option to download that into a zipped shape file. So another great benefit to that Okay, are we back? Yep, we can hear you. Great, okay. Um, so um, just to, to briefly show how this draw tool works again, because I'm not quite sure when, when we got cut out, um, but I did see that you know part of my service area was was overlapping this protected area, and I, I as an applicant you know may decide that I don't I don't want to overlap that area. It may cause some issues during the application process, so I want to go ahead and draw a new um, polygon where that area is not my my shape file my PFSA is not overlapping a protected area. So I'm going to use again the polygon tool. And um, I'm just gonna click to start drawing, just like it, the, help the help tool that's up on the screen. And as soon as you start clicking, you'll start creating vertices. So I am going to draw my new polygon, my new PFSA, where it does not overlap that area. And I'm gonna double click to finish drawing. So I'll select run again, just to calculate um, just to be sure that I'm still within the socially vulnerable community, which I wanted. Um, and I can see that, great, I am. So with my new area, I both have that um, evaluation criteria that I was looking for, and I'm no longer overlapping an eligibility layer. Um, so another uh, added functionality here that we have is the ability to download our shapefile. Um, so you can use this as often as you need. If you have several PFSAs, you can go through and draw each of those PFSAs and download each of those files. And it will download a zipped shape file right to your local computer. Um, this is actually a really great uh, tool because it is actually compatible with our application intake system. So you could theoretically draw all of your service areas in this publicly available map, um, download those zipped shape files and use them within the application intake system, which is also great uh, for those entities that may not have the um, access to any GIS tools. 
So that is how you use the, the functionality of our um, publicly available map. Um, we will have future workshops that detail the, um, the mapping system within, within the application system later on in the year. Um, so definitely tune in for those. Um, I also encourage you again to use this help tool if you ever run into any issues. It has lots of great um, tips for you. Um, and it also, if you have any, um, if you continue to have problems and need some, some more help, you can always put in a, uh, a ticket with the help desk. Um, so that is all I have for you guys today. So I'm going to pass this back over to Ken Wiseman to finish out our session. And I want to thank Ariana for that great demonstration. As I've said before, and I'll keep saying it again, we've got some great staff here that do a lot of amazing things. And um, if you want a mapping question answered, I will tell you that I go to Ariana and, and some of our other mapping specialists on a regular basis. So thank you very much for that. Now we're going to cover some next steps. Next slide, please. I really love this slide. It gives a, a great demonstration of how the FOA, the reg, and the application guide are all independent, but all work together. And it's important for everyone to understand how they do work. It's also important for everyone to understand the order. There is an order of authority that these documents live under. The regulation and the FOA contain the program requirements. The regulation is the more senior of the three documents, and it is the one that changes the least. The, the funding opportunity announcement will change for each round of funding. It is a funding opportunity being announced. Uh, so where's the regulation? It, it, it is there and you can read it now. Um, it, it's not changing going into round four. Application guide would also be your go-to for completing the application. That thing's like almost 300 pages uh, for round three. It had tons of great images. So as you're moving through and you're wondering, what should this actually look like? There's probably a picture and it'll really help you. It's also search friendly. So control F, just start searching by keywords. That's what I do. It works great. And some of the uh, uh, other, other common search features that you can maybe use that are there, but uh, I use control F a lot. We will cover all of these documents much more in depth when we go into the webinars and the workshops in the future, as well as their Q and A periods that are, are with those events. Next slide. The Reconnect Regulation, extremely important document. As noted, the regulation helps inform the requirements of the Reconnect program. Applicants should read and become very familiar with this. It uncovers important topics such as applicant eligibility, environmental requirements, financial requirements, which include tier and DSCR and current ratio requirements that you really should become familiar with now. It also has network requirements and interest rates for the loans are discussed in the regulation. Applicants should uh, consider if they will need assistance from an outside consultant to complete their application, uh, especially sections such as environmental, financial, and network. However, I wanna be clear, we do not recommend, we do not research, we do not endorse on those consultants. So you will have to find your own if you decide to hire. Next slide. The funding opportunity announcement, uh, in addition to the regulation, we do have this FOA. The FOA will contain tons of information such as timelines and deadlines, the amount of funding available, uh, and how we divide it by the streams of funding, the types of funding. It'll include the minimum and the maximum amount that may be requested in an individual application. It'll have details on matching requirements. That's always a question we get about matching funds. Matching funds are gonna be explained in depth in the FOA. The definition of sufficient access to broadband will also be in the FOA. You'll have the required build out speeds, scoring criteria, and 
Some important information from the recently adopted legislation, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, which would have an impact on this program and, and many other things that are out there, but the IIJA language that could impact us. Next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about evaluation and processing procedures. I'm not going to go into details that are in the FOA. Only loan applications are not competitively scored. They are accepted and we evaluate them on a rolling basis while the window for applications is open. But just because we accept them on a rolling basis does not mean you should rush through it to submit it quickly. We'd rather see a complete, thorough, detailed application that describes a, a robust project rather than to one that have one that we come back and have to ask a lot of questions on or one that you have to make adjustments to. Loan applications will have their own pot of money and they are not competing against the grants and the grant loan combinations for funding. Combination of loans and grants, as well as 100% grant applications are scored competitively. They will be evaluated after the application window closes. Applicants may submit one and only one application as the one that we will consider. Now you heard me say you'd have to start another application. If you uh, mess up and, and you wanna change whether or not you're doing ILOC or change whether or not you're publicly traded or change the type of funding you wanna be considered for. You can create all the applications in the system you want, but you can only click submit. That rep sign cert will only be able to click submit on one application. We do reserve the right to ask applicants for clarifying information and additional verification of assertions in the application and applicants selected for funding will receive award documents from RUS. Next slide. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Let's do a summary of everything we covered today. Next slide. Here's your homework list. People want to know, what can we be told now? What can we work on now? Here it is. Uh, this is, really is a, a, a condensed version of it. The slide deck's available. Read through it. Uh, but we do have this condensed list. Every single user, every single one of the users who come on must have a level two verified eAuth ID. Please register and get that now. You will need to submit a new uh, or possibly an updated ARR, depending on your situation. Again, if you're a returning applicant and the roles are the same, you do not need a new ARR if you also have access to all of those communities that we talked about. So you need to decide if you need to update or submit your ARR. And if you are gonna need to do that, go on and work on your resolution. If you're considering whether or not you will cross tribal lands, in your project or serve tribal lands, you need to be consulting with tribes now to get the appropriate resolution from those tribes. Please read and understand that reconnect regulation. It's very important. I get tons of questions and we literally are gonna copy and paste right out of the regulation and give you a citation right to it. So please take the time to read through it. Assemble all the account documents that you're gonna need Prepare your historical and pro forma financial data. Now that is something that tends to take a little time. Obtain the audit. Assemble your market research, including like uh, considering what your PFSA or multiple PFSAs might be, what kind of service might already exist in those areas, what speeds may be offered in those areas, who those current providers, potential competitors are for those areas. If you're going to hire consultants, you're going to want to make that decision now. Again, we cannot provide you a list. We cannot provide you suggestions. We do not endorse them. Next slide, please. We have a ton of available resources that will help you with your application. 
Uh, please keep in mind that this is really only the start of the outreach events. Uh, as you heard our acting administrators say, it's a blockbuster summer. Uh, we're going to do a lot of things this summer. It is really exciting. We, we will be hosting uh, multiple deep dive webinars. We're going to have a multi-day workshop where we will literally walk through the application, piece by piece, item by item. We're going to have what we call AMAs, ask me anything. You can just come on and ask us whatever question and whatever issue you're dealing with. When you go to the ReConnect website, I know that link's in chat, you can go to the events page. I encourage you to check it frequently. Check it a couple times a week if you want to and register for as many events as you want to come to. We, we encourage you to do all this. Uh, that way you'll have a smooth application experience. Uh, you may use the FOA, or excuse me, the uh, application guide for the sections that we have talked about that won't be changing. However, we will publish the round four application guide in its entirety, updated with the FOA four information once the FOA four uh, is, is made public. I cannot stress enough the general field representatives, those, those folks are phenomenal. Um, I will tell you that they have years of experience, but they also have local experience. So they know the area that you're in. The links that you see here are a ton of things that are there. If you click on that contact us link, um, there's a really good chance you'll, you'll get um, some of the people that you've had and we will be able to answer your questions there. Now I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Joan and bring in some other colleagues and we're gonna to go to Q&A. So if we can go to that next slide for Q&A and Joan, this is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joan Kaiser. I'm really happy to be with you. I am also a management and program analyst in the policy and outreach division. I'm gonna be calling on a couple of people um, this afternoon to help answer some questions. And for those of you that did put questions in prior to our brief break in connectivity, I do have a written record of those and we will get to them, as many of them as we can. We do have a lot of great questions. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in and I'm gonna ask my colleague, Chris Proctor, who is our acting branch chief in the operations branch in the policy and operations division to take the first one. Chris, um, this is kind of a two part question. So I'll read them both and we can take them one at a time. Inter are intertribal consortia eligible applicants and should they apply as tribes or cooperative mut or mutual organizations? So just to start, I think Ken maybe touched on this in the eligibility section, but um, consortiums are not eligible to apply for the ReConnect program. There has to be a single applicant. So um, I may need a, a little bit more detail on how that intertribal consortium is organized, but if there is one tribe that is interested in taking the lead, owning and operating the assets and ensuring that broadband service is provided to the other tribes, then that is certainly an option. If the consortium is looking to apply as a cooperative, it sounds like that could also be an option as well. It's hard to say which route you should take, but you know, just keep in mind that whoever the entity is, they're gonna be responsible for owning and operating the assets um, that are financed by either the loan or the grant. Thanks so much, Chris. And um, if you want to put um, project specific details into a contact us question, we can try to research this a little bit further for you. Um, so go ahead and feel free to do that as well. So next question, Ken, I'm gonna go over to you. And the question is, is a county allowed to be an applicant in a scenario where they own the fiber and lease it to ISPs, must they have prior experience in this? Uh, so that that's interesting because it, you know I think that that gets to understanding their legal ability to own equipment. Obviously, the award recipient has to own it. Um, you talk about having prior experience. We do ask for uh, the experience that the entity has. Um, I think that that's a question we're gonna to need to understand a little more about because when you talk about leasing it out, 
um, what would that look like? So if, if they wanna reach out to us by a contact us with more details, we can, but to be clear, yes, that county is gonna have to be the one that owns the equipment and is legally responsible for the uh, language in the award documents. Thanks, Ken. So the next question, Ken, is what's the economic life of the loan? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? No, a loan. Um, if you do, if you don't have that answer at your fingertips, I may be able to take a crack at it for you. Yeah, please, please do. I don't have it sure. right in front of me. Absolutely. So basically, it's not really the economic life of the loan. Um, the loan term is going to be based on the composite economic life of the facilities that you're constructing with the loan funds. So it's basically the loan term is going to be the composite economic life plus three years. That, that composite economic life is going to be based a lot on the depreciation rates of the types of equipment and facilities that you're buying and constructing with a reconnect award. Um, this is actually covered in the round three application guide. I don't believe there's going to be any big changes with regard to that and how the system functions and calculates that composite economic life. So I just want to let you know that. Um, and the next question, I actually, I'm going to take a stab at this, but I know that we've got um, a couple of general field representatives in the audience um, who may want to take a stab. So um, Andy Hayes, um, Shannon Legree, um, Rick Sturdivant, um, Lupe Valdez, I know I saw your names. If you could raise your hands, we can get you unmuted. A um, couple of these questions may be good for you. So the next question is, are the purchase of IP addresses eligible costs? Well, it kind of depends. Um, in terms of what you're gonna use those for, if they are directly 100% attributable to the actual project, that is they're not regular operating expenses, then generally speaking, yes, they are probably gonna be eligible. And keep in mind that 2 CFR 200, the cost principles govern what are specific line item eligible costs. Um, and with that, I didn't know if um, maybe we could unmute um, Shannon Legree's uh, microphone and have Shannon take a crack at this one for us. Okay, I'm a muted Joni. I'm going back. <laughs> this is Shannon, by the way. <laughs> Good to hear you, Shannon. Man, yeah. Going back to that now, going back to that question. What is that question again? Because I sure, sure. Are purchase of IP addresses eligible costs? That I'd actually, um, to be honest with you, I'd actually have to go back and look that up to give them a very definitive answer on that question. And go back to oh, another for you and so forth to see if that's going to be an eligible, um, an eligible product cost. Yeah, it was kind of. A little bit hazy for me as well, Shannon. I took a quick look at, at 2 CFR when it when this question came in and I wasn't entirely clear, which is why I wanted to throw it out to the GFRs in case that they, they had any sort of real world experience with that. Um, you know, please do jump back in while we're still live online if you get a little more definitive answer. But again, if you'd like um, a fully researched answer on this, please do submit it through contact us and we will get you um, a, a researched answer for it. So Back to you, Ken. The next question is, if a county or munici municipality by law cannot own or operate broadband infrastructure, would they need to have an executed agreement with an ISP to apply for reconnect? So this, as uh, they, they kind of go on. So they say in this oh. same scenario, would the county or municipality need the ISP to apply or can the county or municipality apply? Okay, so as you heard Chris touch on, and as we talked about in eligibility, there is only one applicant. And that applicant, per the regulation, has to be the one who would own the equipment. Um, I'm really glad that they're noting that they know their legal status and not able to have that equipment. So they're, in turn, they're going to have to identify who actually legally can own it. That's your applicant. Great, thank you so much, Ken. Um, another one for you, Ken, is the next question says, we applied for ARPA funding. Are we considered a first time applicant for reconnect purposes? Um, ARPA, what acronym is that, Joan? Sorry, that was the American Recovery Money. 
Oh, okay. Um, so if you've never applied to the reconnect program, then you would be a first time applicant. Thanks, Joan, you Ken. were you you were here in round one. If there if there's a connection between ARPA and Reconnect, I'm missing. Please no, let us know. No, but I don't but, think there no, is. No, if you you're absolutely right. If you've never applied for Reconnect, you are a first time Reconnect applicant. Thank you, um, Chris. Over to you again. Um, is the tribal resolution new, or was this also applicable to Reconnect one projects going through tribal lands? So this is new as of the third round FOA. We got a little bit more specific and said that a resolution is required. So this is not anything that's gonna be new for round four. If you go back and take a look at the round three FOA, you'll see that it's very clear that if any applicant is interested in a project that crosses tribal land, they have to provide that resolution. Um, so no, that is not anything new. Well, it's new for FOA three, but it won't be anything new moving forward. Thanks, Chris. Um, Ken, back to you. It's a question about the required documents um, in an application. What is the broadband operations experience document? That is a document where the entity, the applicant in this case, will actually describe what experience they have um, and give us details on the people involved and the years of experience they have in actually being in this industry and the work that they've done previously. So think of it as a, essentially as a resume telling us what experience you have in broadband. Great, thanks. Um, next up again with you, Ken, does RUS have a target publication date for FOA4? I love FOA4 questions. Um, I wish we could talk about it. We don't uh, have the ability to talk about dates or details. So I'm just gonna have to defer to when that uh, actually comes out, and I would encourage you to follow our website for more. Thanks. So, um, Chris, I think I'm going to give you this next one. Um, it's a little bit long, but it's fairly simple to answer, I think. We are proposing a system that builds a few new towers, but would also lease from existing towers. Do we need to upload lease agreements for all pre-existing towers at time of application? We've identified the towers we need to lease and have started the conversations, but have yet to make such a financial commitment to leases until we know we can actually get grant support for the total infrastructure build out. Yes, you should identify those lease agreements, whether you've entered into them already or not, or whether they are contingent upon getting an award. And um, there is a licenses and agreements section of the application where you will upload your agreement. You can specify whether or not it's an existing agreement, whether it's a draft agreement, um, whether or not that agreement is contingent upon a war. There are a number of different options you can select. Um, but yes, we would ask that you provide that information in your application. Thanks, Chris. Um, Ken, back to you. If USDA, sorry, um, is going to require or make applicant financial submission requirements less burdensome for an applicant that submits an ILOC. Will USDA allow the applicant to recover the annual cost of the ILOC? So to be very clear, ILOC expenses are seen as operating expenses. And as was mentioned, you cannot recover the uh, expense, you cannot recover operating expense through award funds. So you will have to cover the ILOC on your own. Now, was Great. the first part of that also a question or, or was it just a statement? It was just kind of a statement. So thanks very much. Okay. Um, let me read through the next question really quickly again here. This is fairly complex. Um, Chris, I'm going to give this to you, but we may want to bring in one of the GFRs. Um, does an applicant that is new to the provision of broadband have to have a contract for internet backhaul? to an internet pop, and must they submit that contract in the agreement section of the application, even if the applicant is not currently providing broadband service today? So based on my understanding of the question, if you are new to the provision of broadband, that doesn't disqualify you from receiving funding and 
building out your own network and owning and operating that network. We do look for your broadband experience if you have experience operating the network, but I would say that's not an eligibility requirement that would disqualify you um, if you had limited or, or, or no experience. Um, I will say that if you are looking to partner with you know, another entity that's gonna operate that system, another ISP, and you have a contract in place, then yes, we would look for that agreement to be uploaded into the agreement section. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Ken, back to you. Um, regarding the requirement to pro provide evidence of broadband operating experience, does this mean that RUS will not fund an electric cooperative's entry into the provision of broadband if the co-op hasn't previously provided broadband service? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on Chris's coattails right there. Um, the way he answered that really does get to this question too. Um, a first time applicant is an eligible applicant otherwise. So just because you don't have um, a giant resume doesn't make you ineligible. However, that document is still um, something that you're going to have to provide. So I would encourage you to um, look at how you can highlight what experience you may have, but otherwise um, having, you know, trying to become a, a, an internet provider is not something in and of itself that makes you either eligible or ineligible. Thanks, Ken. Chris, I'm going to give the next couple of questions to you. Um, in some cases, they're a little related. In other cases, they're more sort of on the tribal side, which I know that you're focusing a lot of your concentration on. So first up, Chris, is a question that's about the tribal resolution. Have the requirements of what must be included in the tribal resolution changed from round three to round four reconnect? So I can't really touch on what is gonna be in the round four FOA, but I will say that We've heard loud and clear during, you know, tribal consultations and through stakeholder engagements with tribes that if there is a project crossing tribal lands, then they want to see a resolution um, provided in the application that so that shows support for the project. Um, so I think that's I'll, I can just leave it at that. Hopefully, hopefully that that answers the question. Thanks, Chris. The next couple of questions are both related to the source of matching funds. So the first one is, can the new market tax credit leverage lender loan be used as a matching fund for the grant? So I can't speak to that program specifically. You would have to go to um, the statutory language behind the new market tax credit program if that says that those funds can be used as a matching as a, as a match for other federal funds, then the answer is, is gonna be yes. I do wanna take this time to just you know add one thing that I, I know we often get questions on and we'll probably get more questions on because there is so much federal broadband funding out there. Um, but if there is federal broadband funding that is going to states, I know that there is a lot um, that's currently going through that process, those funds are still federal. Um, and so although the state is responsible for distributing them, um, they may not be eligible as a match for reconnect. Um, again, check the statutory language for the program. Um, if funding is just a regular loan from um, a, a, a regular private financial institution, yes, that's completely fine to be used as a match. If it's you know a state government program, then yes, that's fine to be used as a match. But it gets tricky when you're looking at other federal funds. Thanks, Chris. The next question is really closely related. I think you're probably going to provide the same answer. Can you match grants with a loan from USDA? Uh, with grants with a loan from USDA. So the USDA loans don't require any sort of matching requirement. And so as long as the, the funding purposes aren't duplicative as long as they're complementary. You know, for example, if you get a, a broadband grant from NTIA and then you want to come and get a reconnect loan, we can't be funding the same assets. The, the, the projects have to be separate um, or complementary in some way. So um, is that, does that answer the question, Joan? Or was there a um, second? I think there? actually it may be that source of funds really. And I, you know, my take on this question would be if you've got a loan from another program at USDA, again, you have to go back 
to the statutory underpinnings of that other program and see whether that other program allows its funds to be used for match. It is totally dependent on whether the other program's organizing statute lets the government do that, lets the government accept that. That would be the way I would answer it. Um, so real quick, there's sort of another version of a, a question that Ken answered a couple of minutes ago. I'm just gonna take this real quick. Is there a way a new company not having the in-depth financial history can apply and be considered for USDA funding, i.e. loan or grant? Um, again, sort of to tie back to Ken's answer is the not having an in-depth history is not necessarily going to count against you. Keep in mind that applications are evaluated on financial and technical feasibility. You know, if your company's only been around for a couple of years, it's only been around for a couple of years. The one caveat I would put on that is um, if you are a company, uh, uh, an LLC, that kind of organization, S Corp, C Corp, whatever, um, you are required to give us a comparative audit. That requ that requirement means that you you're giving us the most recent year audited plus the previous year, which is gives the comparison. There's no way around that. We're not going to make an exception on that. We haven't in any of the previous rounds, and I don't see us making an exception going forward. So real quick, um, there's a question here um, about the actually the application system. Does data flow from one section to the other? Yes, that's why we strongly, strongly recommend that when you do take a look at the application system, you move laterally across the top, the green navigation bar, which is in one of our slides, work through each section completely before starting the next section. So that's why we mentioned that. Um, and then we've got a couple of mapping questions. So the first one um, I wanna throw to Ariana, will the FCC mapping of areas be the same as the one used for USDA? Hi, sorry about that, guys. No, I got disconnected for a quick second. Um, this is the FCC mapping question, correct, Joan? Yes, that's correct, Ariana. Um, no, they're they're not the same. We have our own um, reference layers, uh, evaluation and eligibility criteria, um, tribal layers. Um, sometimes they they can overlap pretty significantly, but they're not going to be the exact same uh, mapping. Great, thanks. Um, and Ariane, I'm going to stay with you because the next one is also a mapping question. Can applicants now submit discontiguous PFSAs in a single application? Um, so non-contiguous single PFSAs cannot be submitted. So if you have PFSA 1 and PFSA 2, um, PFSA 1 has to be one single contiguous polygon and PFS2 would be one single uh, contiguous polygon. You couldn't have PFSA1, which has a, poly a single polygon over here, and then a mile to the east, another um, contiguous polygon. Um, so I hope that non-contiguous polygons for a, a single PFSA are not gonna be allowed. Okay, great, thanks, Ariana. So Ken, um, Back to you, this is a bit of a repeat, but there's a couple of questions kind of all wrapped together here. When's the fellow expected to be released? What's the timeline of the application window? And when and will round th reconnect round three applications and awards be allocated before the new round opens? Um, so we, we do not have a timeline on when the FOA will be announced because the timeline of that window for funding is in the FOA, I cannot comment on the timeline for the applications um, and everything else that we would take in the round four. So the first two parts, I just can't talk to. The third part, I will say that we are working as hard as we can to get through the uh, record-breaking number of applications that we have for round three. But as we continue to work, we do not have an award, a single award announcement uh, yet that is public. So um, I, I don't know when that'll be. The leadership will put that out, but uh, we, we do continue to work those. 
Thanks, Ken. Um, and then there was one additional question on that from that question, or I'll take it real quick. What does RUS recognize as operating expenses? Again, you need to fall back to 2 CFR 200, the cost principles. That gives a big discussion of what's an operating expense and what's not, but things like salaries that are not directly attributable to the pro to the project or operating expenses, pension expenses, um, office space, um, your own telecommunications that you need to support your own business. Those are generally operating expenses. Unless an expense is really tied directly to the awarded project, that is it's, all, it's allowable, allocable and necessary, it's gonna be considered an operating expense. Um, so let me just kind of keep going down because we're at 258. I want to take another quick look at the questions that have come in since the um, connectivity issue. Um, let me take this one. Um, Ken, how can we know whether the environmental question section is mandatory or not? So I would tell you to start with the regulations so that you understand what it is that we're talking about as being mandatory or not. The second thing I would tell you is that uh, the system is intuitive and will give you uh, direction on what is or is not gonna be necessary. The third thing is that um, our staff will also reach out to engage you on things that are necessary um, if, as they come up. We did that in round three, we'll do the same in four. Great, thanks so much. Chris, I wanna jump back to you um, for the next couple of questions. Um, this person asked sort of two somewhat related questions, but I wanna take them one at a time. First of all, will there be a middle mile component to reconnect for? So I can say, and I believe this is in the regulation that, um, you know, we don't fund standalone middle mile projects through reconnect, we have to, um, support projects that are going to connect end users to broadband service at a set speed. Um, so no, the, the, the intention behind reconnect is not for um, solely funding middle mile services. We, we can support middle mile service, but there has to be that last mile component as well. Great. Thanks so much. And the next question is, will overlapping funds be available to combine with awarded RDOF areas similar to reconnect three? Sorry, John, I'm looking for that question. Could you repeat it one more time? Sure, it's actually over on the open tab. Okay. Oh, will overlapping funds be available to combine with awarded RDOF areas? So when it comes to RDOF and reconnect, I kind of mentioned this earlier and, and this is gonna be the case for most federal funds, um, you know, and, and especially with RDOF, is that funding has to be used um, in a complementary way and not in a duplicative way. So yes, there are instances where an RDOF area can receive reconnect funding and you know, just be sure to account for those expenses and, and separate accounts because we will be working closely with FCC to ensure that you know, we're not funding the same project essentially. Hopefully that, that answers the question. Yeah, thanks Chris. That, that's a great job on that one. Um, next question is, will answers to these questions be made available? Again, we are recording this session. Um, we're going to take a look at these questions compared to last week's and determine whether we post both recording from last week and this week or not. My sense right now is y'all are asking a different array of questions because we have a different array of attendees. So we will probably be looking at posting both recordings. Um, the next couple of questions I'm going to go ahead and take because it is 2.56. Um, definition of sufficient access to broadband. What's it going to be for this round? And what will be the required build out speeds for this round? Both of those are going to be answered in the FOA. So we don't have the information available for you right now on that. And please do note that the regulation specifically says that those two things will be determined by the FOA. So you will need to keep an eye peeled for the funding opportunity announcement. Um, the next question, Chris, I'm going to throw this to you because I'm not entirely sure where this is all going. Does RUS allow reconnect applicants to recover grant application fees? Does RUS allow applicants to recover post-award compliance consultant, consultant fees for supporting and compiling with and filing required reconnect post-award compliance documentation? 
So on the grant application fees, it depends. There are certain pre-application expenses that we can reimburse up to 5% of the total award. Um, generally, that is the first advance that we make with your project is selected for an award, you would request you know, those pre-application expenses be reimbursed with that first advance that we provide. Um, when it comes to the compliance fees and costs, that is not something that we generally incorporate into an award. So that would be up to the awardee to you know, make sure that they're able to comply with all of the different um, requirements that uh, come with a ReConnect award. Thanks, Chris. Um, the next one I'm just gonna read out, but I'm gonna ask the questioner to go ahead and use contact us and submit the question there, because I think we're gonna need to research this for you. Um, questioner says, out in California, we have many agricultural worker communities who are both socially vulnerable and poverty level wage earners. The U.S. Census did not get adequate responses from these communities, so we have great difficulty establishing the poverty layers on our, on our maps. Do we have any guidance here? Initially, I would go ahead, um, once the fun funding opportunity announcement is published and any changes to our mapping layers that we have to make in order to comply with that um, will be on the public map, I would go ahead and take a look at the public map and see if the communities you're speaking about are covered. You may be covered for other reasons. Um, if not, please do go ahead and put that into to contact us because we do take a look at the layers as we're going from round of funding to round of funding. We take in all kinds of information and feedback and that's, we get questions about layers every round and we do look carefully at those in between the funding rounds. Um, quick question about scoring criteria, are they the same as Reconnect 3? Again, Per the regulation, the scoring criteria are defined in the funding opportunity announcement. So that's what you're gonna to need to check to determine the, the scoring criteria. Um, and Ariana, real quick mapping question. Still a little confused about how to use the mapping tool with the additional layers. Reconnect eligibility says rural area with less than 20,000 applicants and the PFSA does not receive 120 service what's the significance of the other layers? Yeah, so uh, the public map, uh, basically it, it has the eligibility layers. Um, so the eligibility layers uh, are gonna be geographic areas where the service area eligibility may be limited for some applications. So that includes our far level four layer or the frontier and remote areas are non-rural areas, the pending applications and protected borrower areas. Um, I would again encourage you to go and check out the service area map data sets webpage. Um, and then you also have your evaluation layers. So these data sets are for um, grant uh, funding types and they are going to help with your scoring criteria. So those layers are going to be the economic need of the community or the SAFE layer. Um, this is provided by the Census Bureau. Um, you also have the rurality layer, which is 100 miles from an urbanized area, which is also the U.S. Census. And then you have the socially vulnerable communities layer or the SVI layer. Um, and this also works with, um, the, with census tracts. Um, so these are all going to be um, areas where uh, the, the community is um, more so, you know, more in need, more uh, at risk. And, uh, and typically building out in these areas will be really beneficial to the community. Again, that's just for the grants, um, the grant type funding. Um, so by using that map, you can check. And we also have the tribal lands layer, which again is a very important layer. Um, so by using that publicly available map at this time, you have the ability to check to see if your service area or, or the area where you're hoping to build out, maybe you don't have a PFSA um, in mind quite yet, um, but you're just, you just want to check out what is in your area. Those are the layers that you can access in the publicly available map. Ariana, thank you so much. Um, Ken, I'm going to throw it back to you for closing remarks because we're now slightly over time. My apologies. We've gone to 3.01 p.m. Well, I'll just say thanks to everyone for joining us. I want to thank all my colleagues, Ariana, Chris, and Joan for joining me as well. Uh, we're going to have the slide decks available here and on the website. We will get the webinar recording up as soon as possible. 
and we welcome any future questions to the uh, contact us help desk. We look forward to working with everyone in the future. Thank you so much. Now back over to our team that's running the event. Thank you again, everyone, for attending, and please have a lovely afternoon.